Hello, day four, and I am coming to you. Um, so you're getting a couple of videos in these early um, days from me because I'm, I'm backtracking when I originally started in January of 2022. I didn't start off talking about the Bible every day. It, it got added in pretty quickly and then it became kind of popular. So I'm having to go back and recreate um, some uh, reflections on Genesis. So thank you for joining me in that today. And I'm going to title today, um, Stepping Out in Faith. And this is the story. So I read, so this morning um, and today I have read uh, Genesis chapters 10, th 11 through 15. And the 11, it's all very fascinating. 11, you know, you could probably do a few videos on that and reflections on that. It's the Tower of Babel or Babel, however you pronounce it. But I'm going to spend time talking about Abraham, Abram. He, we don't know him as Abraham yet. It's Abram. And Abram comes from the land of Ur, which interestingly enough um, means light. The name Ur means light or flame. And I think that's a relevant thing to take note of um, that's mentioned at the beginning. We're given sort of lineage and family history and Abram. And, and then we get the first instruction that Abram hears to leave the land of Ur, the land of, and specifically, you need to leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family and go to a land that I will show you. So literally, it's a journey of stepping out in faith. And as we're even in early January, or I am, if you're starting chronological, you know, like day one of the Bible with day one of the year, but whenever it is for you, um, in particular, when I'm recording this and when I started last year, a lot of us like to step out in a faith journey at the beginning of the year, whether it's with re resolutions or picking a word of the year. For me, I like to pick a theme of the year. That was the whole genesis of Rise and Shine for me. And, um, and it's a journey. Like you believe that you're going to get some, hopefully something out of it, but you don't know, you don't know, but you hear that voice, you hear a call from God. Um, and Abram is a wonderful example of that. And so he follows this instruction and he sets up altars. He's promised. So he gets three promises throughout these chapters repeated, but in a different form. So the first one is in chapter 12, and God says, I am going to um, make you a great nation. You will bless others. I will bless other through. I will make your name famous. I will make you famous. I will bless um, the nations through you, through your descendants. So he's getting a pro He doesn't have children. Um, he and Sarai do not have children. So this is the first, you know, um, vision that he gets of a promise or hearing a God, a promise from God that, you know, I've got you and you will have descendants. And so he goes, he's also with his nephew, Lot. Um, Lot's father was, it died. And so he goes with um, Abram and his family and Sarai. They make an interesting pit stop during a fam famine they have to go down into the land of Egypt, and there's an interesting story in there about how um, Sarai, we're told about Sarai's beauty, and uh, Abram was afraid that he would get killed, so, and they would just take Sarai and make her, you know, and possess her, and they would just get rid of him, knowing that... Um, to get him out of the way because that's her husband. And so she, he convinces her, just tell them I'm your brother. And that way they'll let me live. 
And he was right. They did. But Pharaoh, but, and he was right about them really thinking Sarai was beautiful because Pharaoh ended up taking her as his wife. But then all kinds of trouble came on Egypt. The truth came out. We're not given a lot of details other than this high level, like overview. Um, but, you know, sit with images and stories like that and think about the detail like you can fill in the details but it's interesting to note and I'm not going to camp on it long because through that experience even though it was a there was a famine going on uh, Abram became rich um, while he was in Egypt he got all kinds of animals and possessions and and things. And so when Pharaoh found out who Sarai really was um, and and sent him away, um, he sent him with all of his new possessions. So again, he, he even in famine, he stepped out in faith. God said, go down to Egypt. I will take care of you. Like he, there's this, um, this element throughout Abram's journey or when we get to journey with him of faith faith, stepping out in faith, even when it seems scary, even when it seems the odds are stacked against him. And he even uses his um, strategic thinking to help protect himself. Like God gives us brains and um, that's part of how he blesses us and, and follows through on the blessings is through our own intelligence and strategic thinking too. So I thought that was a it's worth making mention of. But then, so play the, play the story forward. He's with Lot. He and Lot are both doing well, but Lot's becoming his own man on his own journey. And both of their uh, properties and clans or whatever are growing. And it becomes to a point where they're just, it's too much competition. And they agree to part ways for the good of both of them and for all the people working for them and that they need some distance between them. They need more land. And so he says, Lot, here, go pick whatever, wherever you want to go. And um, he does that and then they live well. But then there's another um, a promise also in the midst of this Um in chapter 13, let me just back up a minute, where um, God said to him, at, and he's age 75 at this point, look in every direction. I'm giving you all of this land. I will give you some descendants like the dust of the earth. So the first promise is sort of just a general promise of blessing. Then he gets more specific about direction of looking at the land and comparing it to, you know, the vastness of the dust. Like you won't even be able to count your descendants. It's, there'll be so many, it'll be like dust, the dust. So that's interesting. Um, but now we're going to go back fast forward again. Lot, they're doing well, but then there's war in the land and there's some conquering that happens and Lot gets captured in a, a skirmish or a battle but one of his servants escapes and is able to go back to Abram and says Abram oh my god like lots in trouble he needs you so Abram gathers 318 men that's probably significant I didn't have time to like go down that rabbit hole today but takes 318 of his best men by night strategic thinking he's stepping out in faith he knows that god's provision through his own smart thinking and opportunity and he goes and does the right thing and even though the number he may be outnumbered he's not outsmarted he's outsmarting and he is able to um get lot back and has victory and this is against Sodom and Gomorrah and all the armies. And, you know, that's another story for another day, too. But after this um, victory, it makes the news makes its way back to the king of Sodom. And then we are introduced to a man named Mechizeldeck. I think I'm pronouncing that right. 
And McKizeljack is the king of Salem. And Salem, so McKizeljack, we're going to get into names here. McKizeljack is the king of righteousness. That's what that name means. The name Salem means peace. So we've got the king of righteousness and peace coming on the scene, kind of out of nowhere, out of left feet, you know, left field. Um, we're not given any context other than this. They meet in the Valley of the Kings, so the king of Sodom, and then this King Mekeseldek, who is also um, the a priest of God. So he's introduced as the king of Salem and a priest of God. So when you use the the substitution for the meanings of the names, he's the king of righteousness and peace and the priest of God. And he does something really interesting. He breaks bread. He blesses. He, they, he offers bread and wine and a blessing over Lot. I mean, not Lot, uh, Abram. And that sounds a little like foreshadowing of Jesus, right? And even in the line of David, there is a reference to um, from the priests, the great priests like Mekizeldek. So the name is famous and the reference is meaningful, but we're not given a lot of context right now in, and also by the way, a little tidbit to hold on to and file away for the future. Salem, the city of Salem, it will become the city of Jerusalem. So anyway, all of this stepping out in faith that Abram is doing is going, is being rewarded along the way. But again, he gets another promise in the next chapter. So all of this took place in chapter 14. Now we move on to chapter 15 and we get the third version of the same promise. And this one, we get the extra stamp of the Lord's covenant promise. And he takes Abram outside in his vision and says, look at the stars. You're going to have so many descendants. If you can count the stars, that's how many descendants you'll have. And so three promises. And then after this, there's this mysterious um, ritual that Abram goes through that at God's direction to go get three um, animals, a three-year-old heifer, a three-year-old female goat, and a three-year-old ram, and also a turtle dove and a pigeon. He sacrifices all these animals, cuts the three animals in half, not the birds. So he's got three animals and their carcasses side by side. And then after nightfall, he sees a, a vision of a smoking pot fire pot with a flame in it that passes between both halves of the carcass. Like what? <laughs> um, so again, I think this represents stepping out in faith. And even when we look at yesterday and sort of the, the duality that we have within, and when we have, when we're able to lead with the higher self, um, as Abram clearly did, um, he was able to subdue, subdue and master his ego and live a life of faith and bold action and strategic thinking and even being blessed by kings. And, you know, he lived, a, he was living a good life, but he was um, still like, how am I going to get descendants? I don't have any descendants. I don't even have one son. And so he gives him th this final um promise and then going through this sacrifice of the two halves so it's the two halves and then god i'm assuming god is what is being represented that's what it represents to me as i read it of the the fire pot floating with the flame in between the two halves that god helps unite us in our two halves almost like a heart in the middle of our two lungs um, beating and 
even our mind and our and our heart, our upper body, our lower body, like so much symbology there. And the fact that it's threefold, you know, that's the number of spiritual perfection. And of course, the Trinity of God, and even the fact of witnessing, the fact that he came in three times to witness um, or to give the promise, but that's a triple witness. When we have confirmation, sometimes when we think we hear a word from God, it might not be, it might just be our ego. Like we're not totally for sure, but then it comes again and again um, and confirms us stepping out in faith. Um, anyway, so those are some of my thoughts today when reading the story of Abram and some of these mysterious happenings. And and the other um, interesting thing, I'm not totally sure what to make of it, except I think this just goes back to the strategic thinking with Abram. And even though there was an element of him being dishonest to a point, well, not to a point he was, he, they told a lie going into the land of Egypt, but it was a strategic one for protection. And then when he's um, in this meeting with the kings, with Mechizeldek and the king of Sodom, the king of Sodom says, um, here, take, take whatever you want. And he goes, no, I won't take a thing, not anything more than what my men have already taken or consumed or eaten. I won't take anything because I don't want anybody to ever um, say, well, Abram is rich because of this king of Sodom and he's not having it. But it was interesting that he did strategically before, like, so, so he's a man of somewhat of integrity or honor, um, or it's provision. It's the stepping out in faith, um, and doing what is in alignment. And the, um, the other thing that I forgot to mention with Mechizeldek, uh, lot, so he, Abram turned down this generous offer from the king of Sodom, but in the same scene, he gave a tenth, he tithed, he gave a tenth of everything that he got to, um, to Mechizeldek. There's a lot of foreshadowing there of what is to come and what this all means at a greater level when we choose to trust. And even though we're not sure and we don't see a way that we are called and we are called to step out. And I almost called today chart your own course, but that it was more about charting a course and following God, which was more of a walk of faith and stepping out in faith um, as, you know, and the call to leave your native country, your relatives and your father's family and go to a land that I will show you. And I think whether he literally calls you or I to do the same thing, metaphorically he does. Um, even if you never leave your hometown or never quote unquote, leave your family. Identity wise, we are supposed to not have our identity, identity in anything here on earth because those things fade away, they change. And if, if that's where our identity is and, and those things do change and they will change, then you crumble. You don't, you're not able to handle it as well. And I can testify to that because that has been a uh, part of my journey in trying to figure out what my identity is. Like, what does all of this mean? So anyway, this has uh, been long enough. I think I'm bumping up to 20 minutes. So thank you for hanging in there with me, um, trying to go through Genesis this many chapters at a time is no small feat. So um, thanks for hanging with me. And I hope that whatever speaks to you in this um, book, because there's a lot there, whether it's the Tower of Babel or uh, something specifically about Abram or Lot or any of these names and the scenes and um, that 
it will be useful and practical to you. And as you internalize it, read it, not just read it, but internalize it. Ask God, what it, what does this mean? Like ponder it, think about it. Um, and you might just have a vision metaphorically of a, of a fire pot in a flame going in between your two halves. All right. See you tomorrow.